but there's yet another tube over here. What's this third tube? It's not part of the pancreas. So what we have here is the gallbladder over there, but this is actually connecting up to the liver. And what we have here with the liver, in general, there are segments to the liver, but for this class, I'm just going to ask you to know the lobes of the liver. So there's a left lobe and a right lobe. And again, this is in anatomical directions. So again, the left lobe is on your, their, your patient's left, not your left, your viewing left. And the right lobe, again, notice that the two lobes are asymmetrical. The right lobe is bigger. That's why when you're thinking about body quadrants, yeah, the liver is in the left upper quadrant, but the bulk of it is in on the upper right quadrant. So if you ever had a physical exam at a physician's office, this is why they are often pressed in this area. They're kind of checking the overall shape and size of your liver. Then you have ligaments that attach to, and this coronary lig ligament is very interesting. Notice it's on the very top of the liver, and there's a reason for that. And there's other ligaments as well, and if you were here last semester, remember that ligaments connect bones to bones, but ligaments can also connect organs to tissues. So ligament is kind of like serving another purpose here in terms of the name. All right, so then you have your lit, those lobes, and then if you look on the other side of the, now we're looking, so in, the, in this part of the picture, we're looking at the anterior, but now we're looking at the posterior here. Now there are four lobes to the liver, but it's kind of hard to see in this picture. So we have our coronary ligament, and again, the coronary ligament just doesn't stop at the anterior. It actually wraps all the way around, or actually traces this path all the way around there. And what it does is actually anchor your liver to the diaphragm. So remember your diaphragm is always contracting and relaxing during quiet breathing or just, just pulmonary vent ventilation in general. So what's it going to do? Is it going to actually create a gap between its, the liver and the diaphragm every time you exhale and inhale? The liver actually goes along for the ride because it's actually attached via this coronary ligament to the diaphragm. So this is a big reason why that, that ligament is pretty important. All right, so we have our hepatic vein over here, which isn't very obvious from this picture. And you also have all these blood vessels. Now, what we have here is that we have something called the porta hepatis, and this runs from, to the liver. And what we have here is the hepatic portal vein. Hopefully we have time to cover that when we talk about metabolism. We also have the hepatic artery pop proper, which is again like arteries. It's gonna carry blood away from the heart. In this case, it's the liver's blood supply of its own nutrition and oxygen. And then you have a common bile duct. So this is a little area that emerges between the lobes of the liver. And then you have the gallbladder over here. So when you're, I mean, you might see that in those previous pictures of the anterior of the liver, you couldn't really see the whole gallbladder. So the gallbladder is actually tucked toward the posterior side and back of the liver. It's not immediately obvious from the front. So it's actually more kind of like hiding out on the underside of the liver and toward the back. All right, so this is why this isn't the entire gallbladder right here. It's just being mostly obscured by the right lobe. Now, this is the left, the left lobe and right lobe is pretty obvious as from, seen from the front. But what about the other two lobes? You can't really see them from the anterior. Well, from the posterior, in this picture, it's not quite obvious. So where are the other two lobes? Well, they're definitely in the middle somewhere. And what we have here is the caudate lobe and the quadrate lobe. The quadrate lobe, named roughly because it's kind of like a quadrangle, a four-sided polygon. Caudate, this is where it gets kind of like, like caudal, if you remember your root words, means tail. But it's actually the more superior and upper lobe. So it's like, why isn't it facing toward your tailbone? They say because it looks like the tail of a liver and like, oh, this is like terrible naming. I would have named it the middle lobe or something, like this is the quadrant lobe or this is the middle lobe, but this is what we have to work to, with because someone decided to, th to mix things up with the definition for caudal. All right, so I think this is actually a better picture. This is a real liver, and what it's, now you can see the four lobes pretty easy. Again, in this orientation, we're looking at it from the back. So left lobe, pretty obvious. Right lobe, pretty obvious. And the quadrate lobe, pretty obvious. And Notice that the gallbladder is kind of forming a border between the quadrate lobe and the right lobe. 
And then this groove for the inferior vena cava is much more apparent in this picture. So the inferior vena cava is one of the borders between the caudate lobe and the right lobe. And there's also ligamentum venosum that forms a border between the caudate and left lobe. And yeah, so we also have ligamentum teres forming this border. So I like this picture because it shows the borders between the four lobes of the human liver a little better than that cartoon picture. I mean, it's a very nice cartoon picture, but it's kind of hard to see those middle two lobes. All right, so then what we have here, so this is, we're zooming in, and now we're looking at the cells of the liver. And each of these kind of like, they look like roughly hexagons. They're not perfectly hexagonal like a honeycomb, but they are, they do kind of look like little polygons. And what we have here are all these structures. And in between these structures, you have these major blood vessels. So what I'm getting at here is that you have a lot of blood supply to the liver. So your liver is very important in maintaining your blood's homeostasis and chemistry. So that's why the liver has this extensive network of all these blood vessels. And not only does it have so useful root word, whenever you see these four letters, H-E-P-A or HEPA, that refers to the liver. And then hepatocytes, well, remember site means cells, so HEPA means liver, site means cells, so hepatocyte is a liver cell. And the bulk of your liver are hepatocytes. And then what we have here, again, we have blood vessels, we have veins, we have arteries, and also we have branches of the common bile duct. So these hepatocytes, these are what make bile, that mixture we call bile that's important for digestion. And you also have central veins in each of these lobes as well. So you have all this network of vessels and also bile ducts as well. And then you have these special cells called Kupfer cells. And why am I pointing them out? Well, they're important because they're tissue macrophages. So they're kind of like just lying in wait. But pretty much every drop of blood in your body will eventually circulate and filter through your liver. So another analogy is com that's commonly used in medicine, the liver is like your body's own filter for your blood. I mean, you also have the kidneys that filter out the liquid part and maintain that kind of electrolyte balance, but the liver is also important in kind of cleaning out any pathogens and detecting pathogens as well. So these macrophages, because all the blood in your body eventually filters through the liver, they kind of surveil the, they kind of monitor your blood and see if there's any pathogens and they're there to kind of gobble up any pathogens or antigens. So they're also very important in detecting injury because if there's inflammation, they can, can send out warning signals. They can recruit neutrophils. They can also recruit other immune cells of your body to combat against any pathogens they detect. They also release those, chem those molecules called cytokines that can alert the rest of the immune system and also change the response of hepatocytes. So they're kind of like monitors of your, so if the blood vessels of your, your liver are like hallways, the Kupfer cells are kind of like hall monitors or security guards. All right, so then you have hepatocytes and what about hepatocytes? Well, they make up the bulk of your liver's mass. That's what you see here. But what are the major functions of them? Definitely protein production. So your blood has more than just albumins, or well, actually, this is, they do produce albumins, but you produce many things in your blood plasma. Again, the blood plasma is mostly water, but also has all these proteins as well. Also, carbohydrate metabolism. So your liver can store your glycogen and convert or take glucose, store it as glycogen, or take glycogen stores and release it as glucose. It also can, is very, very important for fat and lipid metabolism. Like you may have heard the term like fatty liver. Well, this is why the liver is like can get fatty because it's very important in controlling the traffic of different lipids in your body. And also, especially if you're going to medicine, nursing, or pharmacology, drug metabolism and detoxification. Your hepatocytes, they produce a big variety, like too many to list that they produce all these enzymes, especially a special type of or category of enzymes called cytochrome P450 or CYP enzymes. They're very important in actually, especially if you take any sort of like pharmaceutical drug, they're actually very important in changing the chemistry of these drugs you take. Sometimes they actually inactivate it. Sometimes they make it more powerful. Eventually your body wants to get rid of things, especially chemicals that are foreign from 
and what we call exogenous. So they're not part of your natural body chemistry. These hepatocytes, they're very important in making the enzymes that allow your body to get rid of most chemicals from your body. So this is why the, your liver is very important. It does all of these functions. Now, they also produce a lot of proteins. And what proteins? Well, you might remember some of these already. So what we have here, oh, remember that ascites due to accumulation of all the extracellular fluid? Well, serum albumins, these are made by hepatocytes. If you have liver failure and these hepatocytes are sick, damaged, or dying, you're not going to produce enough of these albumins, and you might end up with ascites like you see here. Or remember our edema as well. Lipoproteins, these are very important in transporting and shuttling cholesterol and triglycerides and fatty acids throughout your body. Again, your plasma is most 92% water. Fats don't like dissolving in water, so these lipoproteins are very important in acting like little vehicles for these fats in your body to travel throughout your water-based plasma. They also make things like fibrinogen and clotting factors. So if you have a diseased liver, you're going to be have trouble forming clots because if you're not producing the fibrinogen or that cascade of clotting factors that help to form a clot, then you're going to have problems doing that. Complement as well. So the complement proteins, again, those are things you produce innately. So what, if you take complement out of the equation, you're going to lose a big part of your immune system as well. So again, this is why the liver is very important. Even though it's an accessory digestive organ, it doesn't mean it's optional. And that's why if you have liver, and remember, or we just covered what hepatitis and how if you have liver failure or liver problems with your bile duct, that can result in uh, pale colored stools and also jaundice. So the liver is very important. And that's why if their liver fails, pretty much all the rest of your organs will start to fail unless you get a liver transplant or something that helps to restore your liver's function. Okay, so then you already know some functions as well, so especially in like gluconeogenesis and glycogen formation, converting of carbs to fatty acid, but we'll cover that more when we get talk about metabolism.